Okay, let's pray before we start tonight. Father, I do thank you for the wonderful things contained in your word. There's so much revelation, Father, which without the Bible we would have no idea about. And I do thank you for the valuable source that it is. I thank you for its history. I thank you for its prophecy. I thank you for its revelation. But above everything, I thank you for the message of redemption, that it is the means by which we can know about the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Father, and as we come to this subject tonight, I pray, Father, that our faith in your word is going to be increased, that we really will know it is the very word of God. And Father, as we study giants, I pray that our faith should reach a level where we know that if there are giants in our lives, even today, Jesus Christ has defeated them. He has overcome every one of them. And that we have, have no need to fear in any way. Father, as I present this material, I would ask you, Father, to give me clarity of thought, clarity of vision, and that, Father, you will anoint my tongue, that the very words of God should go forth from me. In the name of Jesus, I ask it. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I've been looking forward to the Bible study tonight. It's a subject I've been longing to cover for months. Is it an exaggeration to say years? I don't think it is. I've been longing to get my teeth into this one. And uh, tonight we're studying, therefore, the subject of giants, and the title over the whole talk is The Giants of Genesis chapter 6. And the reason it's called that is because eventually, but not immediately, we'll be going to Genesis and chapter 6. I wonder whether you've told any non-Christians that you're coming tonight to a talk on giants. If uh, you did, you probably had a very strange reaction. They probably uh, screwed up their face a bit and thought, fancy that, fancy going to hear a talk about giants. Because, you see, most people out on the streets, most people who are non-Christian, think that giants are simply characters who are found in fairy stories or characters that have come from mythology somewhere along the line. You know, from the days when men were uh, superstitious, when they had all sorts of irrational fears and they rather thought that trees were beings and they thought they were giants and so they invented all the little stories about giants and so on. But today, of course, we're modern in our thinking. You know, we know a thing or two and we're not taken in by these old things anymore. The children still like them. But of course, we know better that giants have never existed. Well, I have to say this to you, that in fact, if you are a Bible believer tonight, you cannot accept that particular opinion about giants, for you only have to read the Bible a little bit before you discover that giants are characters that are actually in the Bible. It is true that there are mythological stories about giants, but you know, I've learnt this, that many stories in mythology actually have their roots, in fact, somewhere. Do you know that if you uh, look around the world today, you will find communities, primitive communities, advanced communities, cut-off communities, communities that are uh, in touch with their neighbours, that have all sorts of mythological stories about a time when God flooded the earth. And you can go to the islands of Polynesia, you can go to Hawaii, you can go to the steppes of Russia, you can go to South America, you can go to the Red Indians of North America, you can go to Finland, you can go to uh, South America, and you will find isolated groups of people who have stories about the day that God sent a flood on the earth, that everyone was wiped out except for a man and his family who built a boat and took a few animals with them as well. And these uh, mythological stories are all slightly different, but if you actually put them all together, I think there are about 177 different mythologies about this, you'll find that there are certain common features. In Hawaii, they actually name the man. His name is Nuu in Hawaii. That's not bad, is it? Noah, Nuu. Um, very often, it says that eight people survived. It says that the rains lasted for 40 days, and then the, the flood subsided after a year, and so it goes on. And if you look at all these, these similarities are most remarkable and, of course, tie in with the Bible story. And there you have mythologies that actually, if you trace them back, go back to a factual beginning. You see, you can imagine how it happened, can't you? The people who survived, the eight people who survived on Noah's Ark, gradually had children, and uh, soon their children uh, started spreading. They had children. And soon the stories of Noah's flood uh, started being talked about. And soon as they got further away from Mount Ararat, 
So sometimes they added certain things and, uh, you know, made it more gigantic than it, than it really was or added strange little tales on the side and soon mythologies developed. But do you see, at behind those mythologies, there is a seed, more than a seed, a whole panorama of fact. And the amazing thing we're going to find tonight is this, that behind the stories of giants, there really were giants. Do you know there were giants in the land in those days? That's what we're going to find out. You just begin reading the Bible. You'll find giants mentioned in Genesis. You'll find them mentioned in Numbers. You'll find them mentioned in Deuteronomy, in Joshua, in 1 and 2 Samuel. You'll find them then mentioned in Chronicles. And there, if you read these texts, you'll actually find the word giant. I should tell you as well, by the way, they're found in a hidden form, also in Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and Isaiah. I say a hidden form because the word in Hebrew for giant is used, but it's been translated as some other English word. And if you have a Young's Analytical Concordance or one of those, why don't you sometimes try and trace the word giant in Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Isaiah. We learn an awful lot about the giants from those. And so you begin reading the Bible and soon you bump into this strange group of people that we call the giants. Now let me introduce you to them. Right, shall I? In case you have no idea who they are. And let's actually use the name that is given to them in Hebrew. The name which is translated as giants in, in most passages in the Bible is the word Nephilim. N-E-P-H-I-L-I-M. The word Nephilim. I've actually written it up. I understand that only those at the front can see uh, this writing, but at least it's up there and you can come and check it afterwards after we finish the Bible study. And here they are, the Nephilim. I am at the end of a word, it means the plural in Hebrew, so these are the Nephils. And that is the word that is translated as giant in the Bible. It comes actually from another Hebrew word, Naphal, N-A-P-H-A-L, which is the Hebrew word for to fall. And this is why sometimes this word, Nephilim, is translated as the fallen ones. Actually, it's interesting, I didn't quite... Uh, take that as the only translation of the word Nephilim, the word to fall actually is used in a violent way. In other words, that you fall upon someone to attack them. You know, don't you, that often you can say, and the enemy fell upon us from all sides. And that, I think, is what this means. This word is used because it describes a fierce, warlike group of people who are ruthless, absolutely ruthless. I think a good translation of the word Nephilim would be the tyrants. People who, who have no compassion, who are really vicious in the way they treated people. Now here they are. That's the general title. And if we're being accurate, we will call this the Nephilim of Genesis chapter 6. They, there are the giants. Now, fortunately for us, the Bible deals with the Nephilim in a, a most scientific way. It's interesting, if you read the Bible, you'll find it doesn't treat them as mythological. It treats them as if they're just an ordinary group of people, like the Egyptians, like the Greeks like the Ammonites, and you had the giants as well. That's how the Bible views them, just perfectly ordinary group of individuals. And so the Bible gives us a few other details about them. For example, it tells us some of the details of the clans that formed the Nephilim. There was one clan, for example, which is called the Anakim, A-N-A-K-I-M, the Anaks. And don't be confused by these words, don't be put off by them. Uh, the word Anakim comes from a very famous giant whose name was Anak, A-N-A-K. And he was such a famous chap that all of his uh, children and his grandchildren were named after him and they became known as the children of Anak or the Anakim. Let's uh, begin by having a look at uh, a few of these Anakim, shall we? Let's go to Numbers and chapter 13. Numbers and chapter 13, where we have the incident of the spies going into the land. Do you remember the Jews had just come out of Egypt? They're through the Red Sea. Pharaoh's defeated. They'd seen God move on their behalf. And God takes them straight up to the border of the promised land. He says, right, send 12 spies into the land. Go and reconnaissance the whole land and see how good it is. And they go into the land and they see something they didn't quite expect in the land. Remember this because... A little later on, we'll see how shameful this is. Verse 21 of Numbers 13. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they descended, they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where a hymen, 
and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Do you remember their description? Oh, the giants are in the land. We were like grasshoppers beside them. And they come up and they complain, we can't possibly take the land. We didn't realize there were giants in the land. And there's this wailing that goes on. Do you remember all the people started wailing and the children of Israel had a nervous breakdown nationally? Do you remember that? They were up all night crying and Joshua and Caleb wanted to get some sleep and they couldn't because of the wailing of the people. They'd seen the giants in the land. Now here are the Anaks, right? The Anakim. And they had built Hebron. Oh, by the way, I just in passing, I love the little reference that's in brackets at the end of verse 22. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And the implication there is that as Hebron was a city of the Anakim, so was Zoan in Egypt. Now I don't know whether you know this, but there's a lot of problems concerning the origin of the pyramids. Did you know that? And no one's quite sure who built them. Some say Moses built them. Others that the Egyptians used hundreds of thousands of slaves to build them and so on. Can I just throw another spanner into the works and say that I wonder whether in fact the giants might have had a hand in the building of the pyramids. Do you all know the problems that are associated with the pyramids? Builders looking at the pyramids today wonder how any person could have built them. First of all, the base on which the pyramids is built is so level that we could only just equal it today. And they can't understand how people living so long ago who were much poorer than us technologically could actually have provided such a level base on which to build uh, the pyramids. It's a major problem in engineering, that, in ancient engineering. The other thing is, how on earth did ordinary men move such a vast number of uh, blocks of limestone and how did they actually cut them so accurately? Do you know there are two and a half million blocks of limestone in just the three pyramids at Giza? Two and a half million blocks. And they are cut so accurately that when you look at them, do you know the gap between the stones is only one or two millimeters between each stone? All two and a half million a place like that. And engineers today look at the pyramids and they wonder how it could possibly have been done. We've got a problem with this. You see, we're used to large numbers, aren't we? I mean, the government's talking in terms of billions. Thousands of billions. So this year, America had a deficit of $200 billion. And we think, wow, 200, well, you know, 200, 200 billion, what's that among friends? And we forget, really, just how large this is. Do you know, it's reckoned this that if you dismantled the three pyramids at Giza, you would have so much limestone that in fact you could build a wall nine feet tall and three feet thick and you could completely go right around the edge of France with it. Do you imagine that? You could build a wall all the way around France, nine feet tall and three feet thick, just from the limestone in the pyramids. We're talking about something really remarkable. You imagine today, if someone decided we're in danger of being invaded, we're going to build a wall right round Britain. I mean, most people would scratch their heads and say, it's impossible, it's too big a task. Yet that's the equivalent. No, France is bigger than Britain. That's the equivalent of what they did in Egypt. Well, I just throw that in a little spanner into the works. I wonder whether the giants might just have had a hand. If they did, it's probably the Anakim who did it. All right, now there's another group of people, another clan of the Nephilim. These are called the Rephaim, R-E-P-H-A-I-M. There they are. And again, don't be confused by the word. It's based on another famous giant who's called Rapha, R-A-P-H-A. And sometimes Rapha is translated as giant, but it should be Rapha. It's the name of a giant, you see. And I suppose the Anakim are best known, but the Rephaim actually supplies with the most famous giant of all time. For Goliath was one of the descendants of this man, Rapha. And I think it would be worth our looking at the family of Goliath, because we actually are given information about it. Let's go to 2 Samuel. This is a lovely little passage, and you'll see how historically the giants are treated in the Bible. In 2 Samuel 21, And I'm going to read verse 15. Now, this is David's campaign against the giants. It's probably David who annihilated them finally. And so when we read this, we're reading about the annihilation of the last giants 
that were on the earth. They haven't been around for 3,000 years. You'll be relieved to know as you travel home to Bogner. <laughs> All right? 2 Samuel 21 and verse 15. And here we have the direct family of Goliath. Verse 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet, had yet war again with Israel. And the Philistines had made an alliance with the giants, the last remaining giants. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines and David waxed faint. And Ishbi Benob, there's the first of Goliath's brothers. Right? Funny name. These giants were funny people. Right? Ishbi Benob, which was of the sons of the giant, which is literally of the sons of Rapha, the weight of his spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight. He, being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. He wanted to kill David. But Abishai, the son of uh, uh, Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt no more go out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass, after this, that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, Sib Sibachai, the Hushathite, slew Saph, there's the second of the brothers of Goliath, which was of the sons of Rapha again. So there's Saph. Verse 19. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elkanan, the son of Jare Oregim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Now there you've got two giants mentioned. You've got the brother of Goliath and you've got Goliath himself. If you keep the finger in, your finger in the place, if you go to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 20, we actually have the name established, <clears throat> the name of this giant. I'm going to read from verse 4. It's exactly the same incident. And it came to pass after this that there arose war at Giza with the Philistines, at which time Sibachai, the Hushathite, slew Sippai. Now that's another name for Saph. It's the same word in Hebrew, Saph. That was of the children of the giant, and they were subdued. And there was war again with the Philistines, 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5. And Elkanan, the son of Jair, slew Lami, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, whose spear staff was like a weaver's beam. So Lami, L-A-H-M-I, was another brother of Goliath. Then you get Goliath, there are four so far. So there you've got it. The fifth then, in verse 20, we don't know his name. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to Rapha. You see that? And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to Rapha, the giant, in Gath, and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servant. So those four were giants. Goliath had been killed earlier. They were a total of five in the family. And by the way, isn't it interesting to note this? Because if you actually now turn with me to the story of Goliath's death, you'll notice something about David. Now, I wonder whether you've actually noticed this. If you go to 1 Samuel 17, in 1 Samuel 17, in verse 38, you have Saul giving David his armor. Right? 1 Samuel 17, verse 38, And Saul armed David with his armor, put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a great coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. Verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Have you ever noticed that? When he went into battle, he had his sling with him. He didn't just take one stone, he chose five stones. Why? Well, one for Goliath and four in case his brother showed up. <laughs> That's nice, isn't it? And it's one of these added little touches and tells us in this passage that we, this is history, this is fact concerning these particular giants. All right, now there are the two main groups of the Nephilim, the Anakim and the Rephaim. We actually also have a reference to three other groups of giants. 
But by the time we meet them, they've already died out. You see? And it's interesting, this passage. Go to Deuteronomy and chapter 2 and let's meet these. This is 40 years after the spies have gone into the land and the children of Israel have been wandering about in the desert and God decides to take them up the east side of Jordan. Now they're going to cross over Jordan into the land but he wants to show them one or two things. And one of the things he wants to say to them is look, at the time that your fathers were afraid of the giants people who aren't even Jews were killing them off. You read this. Deuteronomy chapter 2 Verse 9. Now, they come along to the land of Moab and God says, don't you touch the Moabites. I've given them that land. You can't have it. Look what he says. The Lord said unto me, distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I've given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. The Emim, there's the group of giants. E-M-I-M. Shouldn't be an S there. Might like saying the the M, right? The Emim dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim, which also were accounted giants as the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Emim. There they were. So, but they've been destroyed by the Moabites, you see. Moab had moved in, had killed off the giants and occupied the land. This is a staggering indictment against Israel, isn't it? Israel, with God on their side, couldn't do it. And the Moabites, without God on their side, could do it. Staggering. The next group, mentioned in the next verse, verse 12, the Horim, another group of giants. The Horim also dwelt in Seir before time. This is the land of Edom. But the children of Esau, Edom, succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession which the Lord gave unto them. Again, they destroyed the giants. And then in verse 18, we get a lovely group. These are my favorite group. I think know nothing about them, but I like the name. Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. Isn't that lovely? I'd like to be called a Zamzumim. <laughs> Z-A-M, Z-U-M-M-I-M. The Zamzumim. By the way, the word Emim tells you something about who they were. The word Emim can be translated as fear or terror. These are a terrible group of people. The word Zamzumim is the word for plotting or devising evil. Do you see? Now, that's a, these are pretty bad names, aren't they? The Nephilim, they fall upon you and destroy you. The Emim, they, they give fear into your heart. The Zamzumim, they're always plotting evil against us. The Horim are quite a come down. Uh, their name can be translated as troglodytes. I better explain what a troglodyte is. Troglodyte is a cave dweller. They used to live in the caves in the hills, you see? Now, these are three groups of people, but notice in the days of Moses, these had already died out. And this is what we're going to see about the giants. They were dying. They were completely dying at this time. There were only a few of them to begin with, and they were dying out very rapidly. And so, as we've seen by the days of David, they're just about finished. All right? Uh, just after this, in Deuteronomy 3, God takes Israel north. Now, they've got giants to destroy in the land. They've got to have a go before they go in there. And there's only one giant left alive on the east side of Jordan. And so we meet him. He's the second most famous giant. After Goliath, if you say to people, name me a giant, most say Goliath. If you then say, name me another, well, the non-Christians would name one out of their children's books. I must say, I don't read books like that to my children. And they have enough excitement in the Bible. Um, but if I ask most Christians, most would say Og. And Og is the giant that they go and defeat. And we'll just read it. And then we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edri. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand, and thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until none was left to him remaining. 
Now, if you've got a marker, could you put it in the place there? Because I want to come back in just a minute to verse 4 and verse 5. And if we now turn over the page to verse 11, he was a giant, all right. Look at this. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Not a bedspread of iron, as I've accidentally said once or twice. A bedstead of iron. It, is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Do you know, that's a wonderful little reference. What he's saying in this book is, look, you all know he had this iron bed, bedstead. You've got to think about that. You all know he did. Look, it's in the museum in Rabbath. Haven't you been there and seen it? It's still there, folks. That's a lovely historical reference. You see? Nine cubits was the length thereof. Thirteen and a half feet. Anyone here got a bed thirteen and a half feet long? Anyone here got a bedroom thirteen and a half feet long? And four cubits, the breadth of it, right? That's six feet wide after the cubit of a man. And these are historical details that show us that this man really existed. All right? Okay, so Og was destroyed. Now that's the giants cleared from the east side. They're still in the land. And when the Israelites went in and took the land, they started killing off the giants. All right? There was nothing about conservation going on at this particular time. And the giants became extinct. One chap who killed off quite a lot of giants and did it with relish was, of course, Caleb, who was one of those who told the children of Israel to go in and possess the land anyway. And 45 years later, he says, Right! Now I'm going in to take my possession. And do you remember what his possession was? It was Hebron. Lovely. He had an eye for good architecture and he knew these giants were very good at building. He wanted to take over Hebron. And so he does. I think we'll just see that for completeness sake. All right? Joshua 15. Joshua chapter 15. <clears throat> Sometimes in my Bible studies you wish you had six fingers like the giants, don't you? You keep your finger in the place and everything. But here is Caleb doing his bit. All right? And unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Sheshai and Nahiman and Talmai, the children of Anak, and he went up thence to the inhabitants of Debir, and the name of Debir was before Kirjath Sepha. All right? And there we have the destruction of the Anakim. And so, as we've seen, a few giants remained. Finally, David killed them. Now, that's a potted history of the giants. All right. Having said that, what I want to do now is to say, well, of course, the Bible, having said there were giants, would try and justify it. What we've got to do is to see if there's any evidence outside of the Bible for the existence of giants. And if we look at other evidence, we begin to find quite a lot of evidence for giants. Let me give you some of this uh, evidence that's around. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 3. There was a man last century, an archaeologist, Bible scholar, whose name was J.L. Porter. And uh, he decided to do a complete tour of the Holy Land and the area around. And one of the places that he visited was the land of Bashan. And when he got there, he found the most remarkable things. He actually quotes this little passage in Deuteronomy 3, verse 4 and verse 5. These are the cities of the giants. And we took all his cities, this is Deuteronomy 3, verse 4, at that time, there was not a city which we took not from them, three score cities, sixty cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Arg in Bashan. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates and bars, besides unwalled towns a great many. And this man, knowing how big uh, Bashan was, said it's impossible. You mean there were over sixty cities in Bashan? And he'd read this and he'd never believed it. And one of the things he wanted to do was go and see if it was possible. And in his book, he wrote a marvelous book called The Giant Cities of Bashan. Very interesting little book. I've uh, seen a copy. I've actually read this particular book. I think it, forgotten the date, 1858 or something like that. He's got drawings in. I wish it was the age of photographs because he tries to draw things there. And unfortunately, the evidence he saw has been destroyed, you see, by the comings and goings and the wars that have taken place in this part of the world. But this is what he says. He quotes Deuteronomy 3, 4, and 5. And then he says this, such a statement, he says, seems all but incredible. 
Often, when reading the passage, I used to think that some strange mystery hung over it. But mysterious, incredible as it seemed, on the spot, with my own eyes, I've seen that it is literally true. And he goes in the book to describe how he saw the most amazing houses. He saw houses with walls five feet thick. He camped in some of them. He saw ordinary houses which had living rooms that were 20 feet long and 10 feet tall. One house he went into had a main room which was 25 feet long and 20 feet tall. He saw the most amazing blocks of stone that had been cut out. They had roofs of solid rock across the top. And some of these bits of rock were 12 feet long and 6 inches thick. And they'd been cut, apparently, by ordinary people and put on top of these houses. He said it's the most incredible sight. And there were other people with him who also testified of seeing the same things. One was a doctor or a Mr. Graham. I haven't been able to find out, you know, whether he reached those heights of doctorship or doctorhood. But this is what Mr. Graham says. He'll forgive me, I know, if I've demoted him. But this is his eyewitness account. Look at what he says. When we find great stone cities, walled and unwalled, when we see houses built of such huge and massive stones that no force which can be brought against them in that country could ever batter them down, when we find rooms in these houses so large and lofty that many of them would be considered fine rooms in a palace in Europe, and lastly, when we find some of these towns bearing the very names which cities in that very country bore before the Israelites came out of Egypt, I, can, I think we cannot help feeling the strongest conviction that we have before us the cities of the giants. Now, isn't that remarkable testimony from these uh, two people? Is that all we've got? No, it's not all that we've got. We have other remarkable things. There's another great Englishman called Sir Henry Holworth who wrote a book and it was about the same area, the uh, Holy Land and the, the uh, surrounding countryside. And he actually discovered in the Middle East statues, um, sorry, uh, skeletons, giant skeletons. He found uh, some of these skeletons 10 to 12 feet tall. And not only did he find the skeletons there, he actually found the suits of armor that went with the skeletons. And he'd never seen anything like it in his life. He writes about this in his famous book, The Mammoths and the Ice Age. And there they are. Most remarkable. I suppose you have more up-to-date evidence. Do you know there are actual uh, footprints of giants that have been preserved in stone? People who've been looking for dinosaur tracks have suddenly come across human footprints. And not just ordinary human footprints, huge human footprints as well. And they've been uh, actually excavating down to a particular level. They've discovered dinosaur footprints. Then they've carried on and they've discovered human footprints a little further on. Most remarkable. There is a photograph of one. Um, it's in uh, Whitcomb and Morris in the Genesis Flood. And I think it's page 175. There's actually uh, a photograph there for anyone who is interested in those. These are remarkable pieces of evidence. I think you'd agree. You see? Staggering. Well, there's plenty more actually to be seen. So I think we have to say that giants are a reality, that they certainly have existed in the past, even though they don't today. And so obviously, if you have statements made from the Bible, and by the way, the Bible believer, the Bible's good enough, right? We don't have to look at anything else. It's good enough. When you've got the rest of the evidence as well, you have to start wondering, well, who were these giants? And where did they come from? It is important, isn't it, to discover that? Well, the Bible, again, gives us the answer to where the giants came from. And by the way, by giants, we do not just mean very large men. Do you know there have been men that have been very, very tall? There are many men today who are six feet, six foot six, seven foot tall. You see, the, the uh, tallest man that ever lived, far as we know, was eight foot, eleven and a half inches. You see, most human beings, of course, don't even reach that. But we're not talking about just ordinary humans here. We're talking about a group of people who were 10 foot to 12 feet tall, probably at least, and many of them showed the signs of being mutants. That is, they had six fingers, six toes. Most interesting. All right, let's have a look in the Bible and see where they exist. Now, the first undisputed reference to them is in the book of Genesis, as you'd expect. And Genesis 14. They were still around at the time of Abraham. Right? Genesis 14. Now I'm just going to read this, not going to explain the background, but just to show you they were there. 
Verse 5 of Genesis 14. And in the 14th year of Chedorlaomer, and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaim, there they are, the descendants of Rapha, in Ashtaroth uh, Karnaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emim in Shave Kiriathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, unto El Perim, which is by the wilderness. Now there's a reference to various groups of giants. All right. So we have to look before Genesis 14 to find out where they came from. And the answer you'll find is in Genesis and chapter 6. And this now becomes our base passage, and we'll work from here. I want to just read it. Genesis 6, 1 to verse 13. And then we'll go through the details, and we'll see a few things about this. Now, you may have certain uh, queries in your mind. Just put them aside. I'll try and deal with them as we go through. This, but let's just read it through together. Verse 1, Genesis 6, verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became, became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in all in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man from whom, whom I have created, both man and beast, and the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. All right, remind, let us remind ourselves of the background to this. In the first five chapters of Genesis, you have the following scenario. You've had the creation of the earth, and then in Genesis chapter 3, you've had the fall of man. And do you remember when man fell, there was a curse put upon him, upon the woman, and upon the, the serpent that had actually caused the downfall, the serpent being Satan. And do you remember one of the statements made there was this, that one of her seed, in other words, an ordinary human being descended from Eve, would actually crush the head of the devil. Do you remember that? The devil's going to be defeated by an ordinary human being. That was the statement. And of course, Satan listened to that, and he was looking for this seed to come from the woman. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 4, he thought Abel was the seed of the woman. And he raised up his brother Cain to murder him. That was the act of the devil, you see, to try and destroy the seed of the woman who would come and crush his head. All right, in Genesis 5, you then find that the descendants of Adam start multiplying very rapidly. Now, Satan's got a problem. One of these people could be the person who's going to destroy him and defeat him. How is he going to stop himself being defeated? And so he comes up with the most brilliant of schemes. You have to give it to Satan. He really is a brilliant planner. And his idea was this. I know that God's word says that a human being is going to be the means by which I am defeated. Very well, he says, I will try and pollute humanity. I will try and pervert humanity in such a way that there's no such thing as an ordinary human being left. And if I can destroy the whole of the stock of humanity, I have won because not one of them can bring forth the Messiah. Wasn't that a devilish and a cunning plot? And in Genesis chapter 6, you have the pollution of the earth by the agents of Satan. That's what this is about. 
So let's read it again and gradually work our way through, and let's see it, and, and I hope I'll answer your questions as we go through. But we've got to take this step at a time. Verse 1. And it came to pass when men began multiply, to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. These are ordinary human beings. Verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now we know that the daughters are ordinary human beings. That's quite clearly stated, of course, in verse 1. The question it, then we must ask is, who is meant by the sons of God? There are two theories on this. I'll be dealing with the other one later on. But I believe this, that the word sons of God refers to angelic beings and refers specifically to demonic beings. Why do I think that? Well, the phrase in Hebrew is Beni Ha Elohim. Beni Ha Elohim. B-E-N-E-H-A and then the word Elohim. And the interesting thing is that that exact phrase is used only five times in the Bible. It's used here and in four other places. Now, when we look at the other four places where it's used, it's always used of angels without exception. Can I show you some of those? Keep your finger in the place, one of your five fingers in the place. And if you've got six, see me afterwards. And <laughs> let's go to the book of Job and let's just have a look. All right, Job. First of all, chapter one, very quickly, we'll deal with this. Job and chapter 1 and verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came, Bani Ha Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And this is a, a gathering of angelic beings, and Satan, being an angel, was one of those who gathered before the Lord. There's the phrase, Bani Ha Elohim. In Job 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Again, the same phrase, again, a collection of angels. You might say, well, that doesn't definitely say they're angels. Well, the next one certainly does. In Job 38, 7, this can be no one but angels. Here's that marvelous uh, chapter where God is reminding him that he's God and Job is Job and please would Job remember that right, you know the passage he says Job look don't talk to me like this, I'm the God who created everything and he asked him where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth then you're so big and so wise hey where were you, I didn't see you at the time and it says verse 4, where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth declare if thou hast understanding who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. There cannot be human beings, because this is at the very foundation of the earth. No, these are angelic beings, and they have to be. And so the exact phrase, Beni Ha Elohim, locks it to angels. So when we come to verse 2, I think it has to be angels. There's another reason why the phrase Son of God locks it to that anyway. The exact phrase Beni Ha Elohim is used in these places, but there are other phrases that are used that mean the Son of God or the Sons of God. And it's rather interesting, if you look at passages where Son of God or Sons of God is used, you'll find that that exact phrase is only used of five individuals or five groups. And I've listed them up here. Right, and you'll notice this, you can check these all out. By the way, I've done a detailed study of this in my four talks on sonship that I gave, a, gave at a conference. And if you're really interested in this, please get hold of those tapes because they're rather fascinating studies. The people who are called sons of God are the following. First of all, Adam is called a son of God. That's in Luke 3, of course. Adam, the son of God. Secondly, as we've seen, angels are called the sons of God. The third group to be called sons of God, Israel, called sons of God. Number four, Jesus is called the son of God. And the fifth, which is a group, all believers are called sons of God. Now you look at those and you say, yeah, but so what? Well, if you look hard enough at those, you'll find that there's one theme that runs through these five individuals or groups. 
There's one thing that joins them all together and that tells us something about the little phrase son of God or sons of God. And it's this. All five of these came into being by a direct creative act of God. You think about that. These did not come from a natural source. These actually needed the intervention of God before they came forth. Well, let's have a look. Adam, it's obvious with Adam, isn't it? I mean, he didn't have a mother or father. And without God's direct creative act, he wouldn't have been here at all. So he needed God to be here. Secondly, the angels needed God to be here. We, we learn, and we'll be dealing with this passage in Matthew 22, that angels in their spiritual form do not have children. So every angel that exists has to have been created by God, and the Bible confirms that he created an innumerable number of angels. So these didn't come about naturally. They came about through the intervention of God. The third group, Israel. Ah, you say, now hold on. Now you see your rule breaks now. Because Israel surely came from normal procreation. Well, almost, but not quite. Isn't it interesting? The Jews actually descend from Abraham. And Abraham married a woman who was barren, Sarah. Without the intervention of God, there'd have been no Isaac. And as if to underline the fact, Isaac then comes along, he marries a barren woman called Rebekah. And without the intervention of God there, there wouldn't have been any twins, Esau and Jacob. And to underline it again, Jacob then marries another barren woman, right, Rachel, and without the direct intervention of God, she wouldn't have had children either. So you see, Israel came forth from the miraculous intervention of God. That's one of the points we're going to see in the Israeli conference. Number four, Jesus, well, that's obvious. The Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary, and she conceived. Ah, but what about believers? Beloved, isn't this wonderful news? Right? The Bible definitely says this, that you were born through the direct act of God. When you were born again, it was the direct act of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of man, but of God, says John 1.13. Isn't that wonderful? So the thing that marks these out is that each of these categories actually have come through a direct intervention of God. So when we read the little phrase, the sons of God here, they cannot be human beings. They can only be an angelic group. The reason that I underline this is this. You will find that certain people object to this. They say, no, 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 definitely not. It's ridiculous. They say, hold on, Matthew says that they can't have children. So what do you mean that angels coexist with mankind and they start giving birth? I'll be dealing with that in just a minute, you see. What are you talking about? They say, no, it can't be that. And what they say is this. Well, that the sons of God here refers to the children of Seth. Do you remember when Abel died? God gave Seth to Eve. Do you remember that? And he started having children, and they say this was the godly line coming from Seth. And they're called sons of God here to show that they were godly, you see. And the daughters of men, they were the descendants of Cain, the evil one. And so they say this is two different groups of humans. That's what they say, right? You've got the descendants of Seth, the godly descendants, and the evil descendants of Cain. And what happened was they started intermarrying, and that was it. It can't be so. First of all, there weren't any godly people around. This is why the flood came. To say they're the godly descendants of Seth, only Noah and his family were godly. There certainly weren't any godly descendants of Seth around. The whole earth was polluted and violent and had turned away from God. Secondly, if they are human beings, why, when they cohabit, should they suddenly give birth to these giants? There's no reason for it. Why should mutants come forth in this way? Can't be so. And thirdly, if they are human groups, they would give birth to human children. Why would God judge the earth for that? They've been wicked people before, and they were wicked people after. Oh, no, no. It has to be something more than this. Very definitely so. And what is it? The answer is, these are angels. We'll check this out in the New Testament in just a minute, and we'll find they were angels, all right? Definitely. Let's read it again. Verse 1. It came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, 
for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now you imagine this. This is the most devilish attack on the line of Jesus that was ever made. And God looks down and he sees that mutants are coming forth. Babies being born that are half demon and half human. They're not true humanity. And his son Jesus could not come forth from such polluted stock. It was impossible. And so God says, I put a time limit on this before I move. Something's got to be done about it. And he says, you've got 120 years to decide which way you're going. And at the end of that 120 years, I'm going to judge you. It does not mean here that the lifespan of man was 120 years. It does not. Noah preached for 120 years to this perverted generation. And you know something, by the way. 120 years later, he'd only managed to convert his own family. The only ones saved were Noah and his wife, Ham and his wife, Japheth and, uh, Japheth and his wife, and Shem and his wife. They're the eight that were saved in uh, Noah's ark. Absolutely staggering. 120 years and I'm going to judge you. That's what God says. This was urgent. By the way, I have at home uh, a rather interesting document on blood. And this was given to me by um, Professor Waterson who uh, is an expert on medicine and so on. And this actually is an, an analysis of blood which proves conclusively that somewhere in the history of man, our blood shows that there had to be a time when there was a bottleneck in the population. In other words, that the population went right down almost to single or let's say double figures. And this scientist who knows, he's not a Christian, doesn't know anything about the Bible. He has done analysis on the blood. I've got it at home. And it says definitely that we wouldn't have the blood that we had now unless there'd been a bottleneck in the history of humanity. Isn't that rather interesting? I, no extra charge for that, I'd just throw that in. But it is interesting. I'm always on the lookout for these, uh, these little tidbits of information. Very interesting thing. All right, now verse 4. Here you've got it. There were giants, Nephilim, that is, in the earth in those days. Now, what's it mean by those days? It means the days before the flood. Before the flood, there were giants on the earth, and also after that. Now, I'll be dealing with that a little later on. Notice that Goliath had to have been born after the flood. Do remember that, otherwise he wouldn't be here. He would have been destroyed in the flood. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. What do you mean by this? Mighty men of old... Men of renown. These are the mythological characters. I mean, the most famous mythology that we know about is Greek mythology. Did they just make those up, those people? No, they didn't. There's seed truth in all of the mythologies. Interesting. You'll notice this. I mean, I'm talking about characters like Orpheus, Jason and the Argonauts. He was a real chap. Really did exist, you see. Or certainly the char he was a character on which they based that story, right? I talk about Hercules. Think he was a man? You're mistaken. He was one of these giants. Castor and Pollux, they were characters that are mentioned here. And you'll notice, it's interesting, if you look at this passage, the fathers were demons, the mothers were human. You look at Greek mythology, you will find without exception that all the great men of old always had this. They had a human mother and they had a father who was a god. Isn't that interesting? You see, it's exactly the same pattern. Most remarkable when you see it. And that's what it meant. These mighty men of renown, men of old, that's who he's referring to. And these are the characters that come in here. These are the giants, and they were real. They existed. Verse four, 5, I'll read it through. Sorry to read it through so often. It's worth going over. Oh, and by, can I say one thing here? You know, there are lots and lots of stories about I was Satan's bride. Have you ever heard of those? I was Lucifer's child. You have films now coming out. Rosemary's Baby and other films like that. Do you think they're just from the fertile imagination of a human being? You're wrong. They're demons recording their past history and what they hope is going to be their glorious future. And I'll be talking about what's coming on the earth later on. Oh, yes. These, this is factual, this stuff that goes on. You see? Satanists today actually want to be Satan's bride the women. And this is what it's referring to. All right? I have many more details to go through yet, so you're getting, getting rather exciting at this point, right? Verse 5. 
And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I've made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. The earth was corrupt. The word corrupt in Hebrew can be translated as polluted. The earth was polluted. There was no more true humanity, except for Noah and his family. The earth was polluted before God. The earth was filled with violence. And so God looks upon it and decides that he is going to destroy it.